Hey there, interwebs, and welcome to this Halloween episode of How Fascinating. The subject of today's video is bound to make your skin crawl, and I've selected those exact words very carefully. That's because I'll be talking about anthropodermic bibliopathy, or, to put it in layperson's terms, books which are bound in human skin. Now, I can't actually read minds, and I'm not sure I'd want to if I could, but you might be thinking that an anthropodermic bibliopathy specimen looks like this. We'll get that notion out of your head right now. One of the books currently on screen is bound in human skin, but can you tell which? Whichever one you picked, you're right, because the other four are as well. In fact, you're looking at all five examples of anthropodermic bibliopathy in the Historical Medical Library of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, which is associated with the much more famous Mütter Museum. This makes it the largest known collection of such books in one institution, although Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island takes a close second place with four confirmed examples. Coincidentally, Providence is also the hometown of H.P. Lovecraft, originator of the Necronomicon. Harvard University, meanwhile, is home to three books said to be bound in human skin. Alsan Husse's Destiny of the Soul, a copy of Ovid's Metamorphoses, and a codex of medieval Spanish laws allegedly bound in the skin of a condemned criminal who was executed by being flayed alive. Although the notions of a person becoming a book which itself contains tales of people transforming into other things, or an outlaw being punitively turned into a book of laws may seem wonderfully poetic, peptide mass fingerprinting has shown that only the first book, The Destiny of the Soul, is actually bound in human skin. The other two are sheepskin imposters. For those wondering, peptide mass fingerprinting, or PMF, is a process which uses mass spectroscopy to identify organic material. In this case, a tiny sample is taken of the bookbinding in question, and this is then digested in an enzyme called trypsin and placed in a fancy device which shoots it with lasers, and the dissolved peptides, which are chains of amino acids that make up proteins, create a spectrogram. This is the so-called peptide mass fingerprint. Just like with traditional fingerprint databases, these spectrographic results can then be compared against a library of known examples, allowing us to deduce the origin of the skin. Now, PMF is not the same thing as DNA analysis. It can't tell us the gender or ethnicity of the person, or if they were even a human. Peptide mass fingerprinting can tell us that the donor organism belonged to the hominid family, but not the genus or species, so the binding could be made from any of the great apes, such as gorillas, chimpanzees, or orangutans. That being said, no such examples are known or even claimed to exist, and honestly, who'd ever expect to find an orangutan in a library? Despite its imprecision, PMF is still the most accurate, cost-effective testing method we currently have for determining the animal origins of a book's binding. The previous method relied on careful examination of the follicle patterns and the relative positions of the pores, but the tanning process could easily warp the skin and the truth with it. The reason we don't use DNA analysis is because the harsh chemical process of leather tanning often destroys testable DNA, and there's a not insubstantial risk of contamination caused by handling of the specimen. That being said, there is an emerging field known as biocodicology, which uses proteins, microorganisms, and genetic information to study books' production, but the field is still in its infancy, and the DNA sequencing techniques employed are still prohibitively expensive for most collectors and institutions. Getting back to the Necronomicon in Harvard's diverse set of human skin books, both genuine and falsely alleged, one may begin to wonder what kinds of books received the macabre treatment and who they were made for, and from. In some ways, that last question is the easiest one to answer. Condemned criminals, often murderers. If you asked a modern layperson what subject matter they'd expect to find in a book bound in human skin, especially that of a condemned killer, they'd probably say some sort of black magic like necromancy or eldritch lore man was not meant to know, but these books are not modern creations. While there are mentions of human skin books in the early 1700s and an association of the practice with the French Revolution, nearly all confirmed examples were created in the 19th century. At that time, turning someone into a book would be tantamount to desecration of human remains, and thus something you'd never do to proper folk. Executed criminals were fair game, though, since their cadavers were already going under the knife for study. The men holding said knife were doctors, surgeons, and anatomists, and thus they were also the ones holding the leftover skin. I think you can now understand why many, if not most, anthropodermic specimens are textbooks on human anatomy. I mean, it makes a certain degree of sense. If the inside of your book pertains to human internal anatomy, the outside should reflect that. The subject of anatomists and dissecting cadavers brings us to this particular piece, which is bound in the skin of William Burke, one half of that infamous criminal duo, Burke and Hare. If you've never heard of them before now, William Burke and William Hare were a pair of highly unscrupulous businessmen in the early 19th century, to put it lightly. To put it less lightly, they were serial killers, but rather than putting people in the ground, they got their start by averting a burial instead. 
When a resident of Hare's lodging house died of dropsy in 1827, the pair were faced with a choice. They could either pay out of their own pockets to have the body inhumed, or they could make a profit by selling it to the local medical school. I think you can guess which option they picked. This marked the beginning of their career as resurrection men, but although this cool title seems to imply that they practiced necromancy, it was merely the contemporary euphemism for grave robbers. This was actually a real issue at the time, since medical schools required a constant supply of fresh cadavers for dissection, and this even led to the use of mort safes, devices designed to deter body snatchers from exhuming newly deads. Williams, Burke, and Hare took it a step further, though, directly murdering a total of 16 of Hare's lodgers throughout 1828 and flogging their corpses to the local surgeons. As a matter of fact, one of their better customers was the famous anatomist Robert Knox, FRSE. If that name sounds familiar, you may remember that his fellow Fellow of Learned Society, Robert the Flash Liston, once punched him out in front of his pupils for displaying a woman's corpse in a lascivious manner. And before you ask, no, it wasn't mandatory for Edinburgh surgeons to be named Robert or murderers and body snatchers to be named William. It was just highly encouraged. After the body of one of their victims was discovered and reported to the police, Hare was successfully persuaded to turn King's evidence against his murderous business partner, and Burke was sentenced to death by hanging. Fans of poetic justice will be pleased to learn that following his execution, Burke's body was taken to the university's anatomy theater and publicly dissected, meaning that Burke got to provide one last corpse for his trade. The spectacle was so popular, in fact, that police had to be called in to quell the minor riot which resulted from a dearth of tickets for the event. Professor Alexander Monroe, who was conducting the operation, at one point dipped his quill pen into Burke's blood and wrote, This is written with the blood of William Burke, who was hanged in Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head. In the end, Burke was turned into ink and a notebook, but had he gone on the run, he might not have been stationary. And no, I'm not apologizing for that one. The reason why resurrection men such as Burke and Hare were able to make such a killing, not apologizing for that one either, was because cadavers were chronically in short supply. According to Scottish law, dissections could only be performed on the bodies of suicide victims, orphans, and those who died in prison. The notion of cutting up a body after death was practically anathema, and thus it was reserved for only the lowest dregs of society. Many of the people who would posthumously become book bindings likely never knew what their eventual fate would be, and this aversion to post-mortem mutilation means they likely wouldn't have agreed to it if they did. The concept of informed consent is unfortunately a very recent invention in the field of medical ethics, which is itself, again, unfortunately, newer than you'd think. Or hope. That's more depressing than creepy, though, so let's look at the exception to the trend instead. James Allen, also known as George Walton, and half a dozen other aliases, was a 19th century highwayman, and, by any metric you care to use, the archetypical rogue with a heart of gold. Abandoned by his father and functionally orphaned following the deaths of his mother and grandfather, he turned to a life of crime at the callow age of 14 and was first imprisoned in October of that same year, 1824. In his own words, the idea of being in prison operated very painfully upon my feelings. I verily believe that if I had been discharged after the first week of confinement, I should have been honest and steady ever after. In a short time, however, jail scenes in the society of the depraved and vicious became familiar, and I lost, in a good degree, the tender feelings which influenced me on being first committed. There was so much mirth among those in confinement that I soon became quite contented in my situation. In effect, the unfortunate orphan was scared straight, but then turned right back around again to the criminal lifestyle by his newfound family behind bars. He wasn't a bad guy, just a man trying to make a living however he could. From that point forward, he was constantly in and out of prison, and often by some truly impressive means, including sawing through manacles, burning through wooden window bars, tunneling underground, and scaling walls amidst withering hails of gunfire. He apparently conducted himself with such style and panache that his own captors were frequently excited to see how he would escape next, and his eventual recapture was often to a feeling of, oh you scamp. Outside of prison walls, Allen got up to such classic capers as jewelry store heists and smuggling contraband, but he also maintained a sui generis moral compass. For example, he was once stabbed in the head after preventing another crook from stealing a woman's purse. The knife penetrated to a depth of three inches, but Allen somehow survived. He was also opposed to arson, having never communicated fire to any building, and was loath to employ physical force when intimidation would do. That was the plan when he set out to rob John Fenno on the Salem Turnpike. Drawing his pistol, he uttered those timeless words, your money or your life. Fenno, however, chose a third option. Violence. Springing from his carriage, Fenno grabbed Allen by the shoulders, and the two men wrestled for a moment in the road. Still reticent to kill, Alan attempted to frighten Fenno off by firing his pistol next to the man's ear, because nothing scares me like an abrupt case of tinnitus. 
Sadly, trigger discipline being what it was in the 1830s, i.e. non-existent, Alan fired his shot too early and only grazed Fenno's chest. Fenno fell to the ground and Alan ran off. He would later comment of his would-be victim, I thought, on his attacking me, that I had a different man to deal with from any I had previously met on the highway. Alas, Alan's luck would eventually run out in 1837, when he was yet again imprisoned but stricken with a fatal case of influenza before he could escape. As he lay dying, he supposedly turned to religion, befriended the warden Charles Lincoln, and convinced the man to transcribe his life story from dictation. If you'd like to read it for yourself, there's a link in the description, and it's well worth your time, because honestly, the whole thing could be adapted into a major Hollywood film with minimal embellishments. He also requested that following his death, some of his skin be taken and used to bind two copies of his autobiography cum deathbed confession. One was gifted to the attending physician, and the other was presented to Fenno as a token of Alan's high esteem for the man. We can only speculate as to why Alan desired this fate for himself, but a clue may lie on page 8 of his narrative. The first law of nature is self-preservation. It's possible that he saw becoming his own autobiography as an opportunity to cheat the grave, at least in some symbolic way. Although the doctor's copy has never resurfaced, the Fenno copy apparently remained in the family's possession for another 20-something years, where it was used to frighten and spank naughty children. In the 1860s, it was donated to the Boston Athenium, where it remains to this day, and prior to his 2017 retirement, it was under the care of curator of rare books, Stanley Cushing. Cushing also acquired this oil portrait of Warden Charles Lincoln for the library's collection, and if the two seem to share a resemblance, there's a reason for that. While researching his family tree, Cushing discovered that he is, in fact, Lincoln's distant cousin. That's some Charles Dexter Ward shit right there. Working on this episode, I found myself pondering a philosophical question, and I want to see your answers in the comments. Not counting architectural definitions, what's the difference between grim and grotesque? I pondered this semantic query, perhaps upon a midnight dreary, and tis a queer and curious quandary, I am sure. It reminded me of an earlier distinction I made regarding another pair of similar subjects. Two of my favorite subgenres of horror are cosmic horror and body horror. This is probably why the aforementioned H.P. Lovecraft is my favorite horror author. He did plenty of both. Together, the two fill complementary niches. Cosmic horror is cerebral, operating on the mind, while body horror is visceral, operating on gut feeling. The former makes me go, mm, and the latter makes me go, Ugh. The same can be said for grim and grotesque. Grim operates on the mind and the soul, but grotesque affects the body. The grotesque revolts, and we recoil. We are repelled in revulsion and disgust, but the grim draws us in. We can't help but be attracted by a strange, morbid curiosity. Grotesque and grim, revolt and intrigue, push and pull, yin and yang, this is the true dichotomy of darkness. And I just found the title of my debut symphonic metal album. Also, since we're now talking about the making of this video, way back when I first started research for it, there wasn't a whole lot written on the subject, or at least not a whole lot in a convenient, easy-to-digest source. While working on it, however, I got a little gift from the universe and discovered a new book on the topic that was published just last year. Dark Archives, a librarian's investigation into the science and history of books bound in human skin, is exactly what it says on the label, so most of the information in this video can also be found in it, even if it wasn't lifted directly from it. It also, obviously, contains plenty which I didn't mention in this brief video, such as this 1898 publication of Hans Holbein's Danse Macabre, this French edition of Edgar Allan Poe en Poe, and the morbid tale of William Corder, a convicted murderer who was, probably, turned into a book containing the transcript of his own trial. The whole thing is such a compelling work that I didn't even mind being trapped in the bathroom with gastric distress one night because I had it with me to pass the time. If you want your own copy to keep in the bathroom or on the coffee table to disturb unwanted house guests, there's a link, as always, in the description, and there should be another one on screen now to an interview with the author. While I'd love to say more and could talk on the subject at length, I shall restrain myself for now and give you a chance to weigh in. What do you think of human skin books, and would you like to become one after your death? I would, but I'm also a weirdo. Let me know in the comments if you're one, too. Thanks for watching, and have a fascinating Halloween.